Hello, everybody. We would like to start this Carbon Tracker event shortly. As you settle down, a very warm welcome from me, Bernice Lee, from London, who will be moderating this panel today. As you all know, Carbon Tracker recently added this webinar to their schedule in response to the bus amount and the amount of interest around the upcoming Shell and Totals AGMs. And I think the hundreds of signups today confirm just the amount of interest there is in, in these upcoming votes. And I also was told just now that this has been so far the most popular webinar that Carbon Tracker has actually ever put on with around 800 registrants so far. So we definitely look forward to, even though it's an online interaction, a, a lively interaction between the speakers and our audience today. And in many ways, as Shell and Total need no introduction to this audience. And many of you will know that last year at their respective AGMs, both companies saw resolutions tabled by NGOs in the case of Shell and investors in the case of Total. And they were supported respectively by 14% and 70% of investors. And definitely, as, a, as, as in some sense, it is a sign of things to come that expectations are very fast moving beyond long-term goals and disclosures to more short-term actions and business plans. This year, we are seeing the Shell and Total are the first oil majors to table their own energy transition strategies for advisory votes by investors. And today, we will hear from speakers who have recently published their assessments of Shell and Total's plans and are in active dialogue with many investors about them. At the heart of the matter is whether these climate transition plans or strategies are credible. Are they Paris aligned or are they just aspirational? Now, today we will hear from four speakers. To kick us off today will be, and I'm going to go through the list now, and then I'm going to quickly go through some of the housekeeping questions, and then we will go to our speakers. The four speakers we have today are Andrew Grant, who is the head of climate, energy, and industry research with Carbon Tracker. He formerly worked at Barclays Natural Resources Investments, Barclays Capital, and Newbridge Street. He's also a senior advisor to Critical Resource. Following Andrew, we have Lucy Pinson, who is executive director for Reclaim Finance, who last year won the Goldman Environmental Prize and previously worked for Sunrise Project and Friends of the Earth. Our third speaker will be Shuling Liu, who's currently lead analyst at the Australasian Center for Corporate Responsibility. She was in equities research as well as strategy and corporate development roles in Commonwealth Bank of Australia, UBS, Bendigo, and Adelaide Bank. And last but certainly not least, it will be Tim Bush, who's head of corporate governance, pensions, investment research consultants, and he leads engagement for the local authority pension fund forum, LP, LAPFF, on shell and decarbonisation of the steel industry. He's also the former member of the Urgent Issues Task Force of the UK Accounting Standards Board and was director of, stake, of shareholder activism for Hermes as a management as well. Now, there's a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. First is that this meeting today is on the record and will be recorded so that others can benefit from the wisdom from our speakers afterwards. And for our participants, you can submit questions at any time through the Zoom platform. And you will see on your screen the Q&A part where you can actually put your burning questions throughout. Now, of course, we would like to especially encourage investors to put questions that you have on the, on the table so that our speakers can help you think through some of the questions and think through what the bottom lines and the red lines may or may not be. Now, without further ado, I would like to ask Andrew Grant from Carbon Tracker to kick us off with the broader context around this debate. Thank you, Andrew. Now, each of the speakers will speak for five to seven minutes. I'm hoping they will all keep to their time so that we will leave us with the proper, proper half an hour for our questions and discussions from the audience as well. Andrew, please kick us off. Thanks very much, Bernice, and I'll, uh, I'll do my best on the timing. So, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming today. I'm Andrew Grant, I'm co-head of research uh, at Carbon Tracker. Um, just to give you a very brief overview of Carbon Tracker, I'm sure, um, I'm sure many people are familiar with our work, but we're essentially a, a non-profit think tank. We look at areas particularly around sort of climate and energy, 
um, and trying to understand really what the implications are of the limits on fossil fuels and what that means in financial terms, particularly for financial audiences. So what I'm going to do is I'll just give a very brief overview. I'll set the scene um, in terms of the link between emissions targets and whether we can read anything through on that in terms of portfolio management and portfolio resilience in the oil and gas industry. Now, uh, I'm sure many people will be, will be familiar with this sort of chart as a brief overview just giving a, um, a view of the potential, some of the potential worlds out there in terms of future um, oil and gas demand. Well, one thing that's very clear is that if we're going to be successful under the goals of the Paris Agreement to limit warming to well below two degrees to 81.5, we're going to use a lot less oil and gas than we have done uh, or done under previous uh, sort of growth trajectories, I guess, that might have been expected. So the grey area there is the uh, is supply from existing fields. Um, the two green lines are uh, demand under two of the IEA scenarios, the 1.65 degree uh, sustainable development scenario, the 1.6 degree beyond two degrees scenario, or so we estimate it. The real key thing here, I think, is just is to illustrate the difference between those supply line, uh, those demand lines for oil compared to the overarching business as usual steps demand or what they call the stated policy scenario, which is just projecting forward today's um, uh, policy environment. Now, in particular, what's important to focus on is the size of the gap between existing supply and those demand um, forecasts or projections, rather, I should say, rather than forecasts. Clearly, still uh, still a bit of space potentially for new assets, for new development. That might not be the case under a 1.5 degree scenario, but under the 1.6 degree scenario or so we look at here, a little bit of space, but much, much less space available than under the big wedge between supply and the existing uh, and sort of BAU growth projections. Now, how do we figure out which assets go ahead? We use the time-honored approach of letting the market do the hard work, um, just going ahead with the sort of supply and demand 101 using the device of a cost curve. In other words, making the assumption that the assets that go ahead or are resilient under low carbon conditions are those that are most competitive in terms of their production costs. In other words, assets right at the bottom of the cost curve might be able to outcompete uh, assets at the top, which therefore would end up either not going ahead or if they do go ahead, being stranded, or in other words, failing to deliver the returns that might have been hoped for. Now clearly the lower the temperature outcome, the lower the demand, for fossil fuels, the less fossil fuels, new fossil fuels that go ahead, and the lo lower price you'd expect to prevail to incentivize those assets to go ahead. So broadly speaking, that's our framework for looking at things. Um, I won't dwell on it, but essentially it comes down to looking at the relative cost competitiveness and then translating that through to which companies hold those projects. So this is work we've been doing for a few years, really. We've been, been looking at um, and which, which parts of people's asset uh, portfolios fit in a low carbon world, which ones don't. One of the, we've particularly done that on a low car, on a sort of forward looking basis. What's happened, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, is that clearly a lot of um, a lot of companies have come out to the market and said, "Look, you know, this is our this is our view of uh, how we're going to change our um, our emissions trajectory over time." We view this as consistent with the goals of Paris, or we support the goals of the Paris Agreement. And um, you know, a lot of investors have come to us and said, "Okay, well, what does that mean?" Um, so for us, the carbon tracker, we've taken that market that market lens. We've also gone back to really the fundamental principles of what it means to stay within a low carbon outcome, to hit net zero. Um, and that really means recognising the finite limits or the carbon budget that our planet imposes on us. So with, the, with those two factors in mind, um, we also came to the position that it's very difficult to imagine a company as being considered aligned with the goals of Paris if it's willing to sanction assets that are further up the cost curve. In other words, are the projects that effectively amount to a bet against Paris in order to be economic, or viewed another way, the assets that would take us past Paris if, you, if, they, if they go ahead. And by looking at it in that way, you really, you align two different dimensions. I mean, firstly, there's the economic dimension. I mean, I mentioned it in that if you're only sanctioning assets that fit in a low carbon world, then you're resilient under that low carbon outcome. And indeed, if, if demand is higher, you're still generating industry leading returns because by definition, the assets at the bottom end of the cost curve, lowest cost, the highest margin, the lowest risk, but also it aligns it with that environmental dimension. Um, that is to say that over time, if you're only if everyone's investing in assets that fit in a low carbon outcome, gradually um, you know, the supply will be will be aligned with that. And we, we've what we've always tried to do as well is kind of we're bearing those two um, those two aspects in mind. 
given that most companies are now talking about um, alignment with Paris in terms of their emissions goals rather than their investment behaviour, we've sought to, to see how the, compare, the two compare together. And in a piece of research that we published in October last year, um, we looked at the different um, or the relationship between the companies that place well in our analysis of their portfolios and the companies that have the, uh, the emissions targets that appear to do their best uh, or be closest to reflecting the finite limits of the Paris goals uh, of, uh, of, well, <laughs> of, uh, of, the real of getting to net zero effectively. So as shown in the chart, again, I can come back to this later on, but one, one of the things that we can see is there's a very, very strong correlation between certainly in a small sample that we have here of companies that have set um, uh, emissions goals, but there tends to be quite a strong correlation between countries, uh, companies, I should say, that have more resilient portfolios, i.e. those that have a greater proportion that fit in a low carbon world, and those that have emissions targets that appear to reflect those finite limits. What does that tell us? Well, potentially, maybe it tells us that management, they're, they're both symptoms of the same thing, perhaps that management teams um, are generally more conservative overall and in fact looking at emissions targets if they encourage a company not to sort of shoot for growth forever assuming that we're going to fail those targets maybe that speaks to um, to greater um uh, greater discipline on on the uh, on the sanction side and a company that's going to be more resilient in terms of um in terms of the financial aspects of the transition as well as the economic uh, aspects as well and try to do my best to keep to the five to seven minutes uh, limit that Bernice outlined. I'll just wrap up by saying clearly the debate has moved a very, very long way in the last couple of years in particular. Um, all, the, all the European majors certainly have set um, uh, emissions targets that get to net zero uh, or reference net zero that incorporate scope three and cover a large part of their business. You know, perhaps less so on, on, on the, uh, in, in other geographies. But one of the things that we have also observed is that the, the way that companies are investing in their assets doesn't necessarily um, align with this. So despite the discussion of emissions, we still see that companies continue, or certainly have in, in recent years, um, to sanction assets that look like they fail to, 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 to make the cut under a low carbon outcome in economic terms. In other words, they fail uh, to... to deliver returns that might have been expected of them. I've given a couple of examples here. I won't go through in detail. The report's called Fault Lines. I'll publish the, uh, I'll put the, the link in the chat box. Crucially as well, company, a lot, all the companies have these assets in their portfolio coming up for the next couple of years. Now, clearly, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, an important thing that companies are going to need to convince investors of is that the investment match up to the plan, who clearly cutting emissions while all your assets are stranded, isn't a great result. So I think that's a key aspect that we'll need to look at, that companies will need to tell a compelling story around. It's not just about the emissions, it's about the investments as well. And I'll pause there. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I think you set us up very nicely in terms of the sort of alignment between the buffer resilience piece as well. So next up we have, moving swiftly along, and, and Andrew was almost perfect in terms of timing, just went over by one minute, Lucy. So the pressure is on you to make sure that we keep to the seven minutes so that we can roll through. Thank you, Lucy Panasson, please. Thank you a lot. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. So in February 2021, Total CEO claimed to be proud to be an old driller. But today the company wants you, wants its shareholders to believe that the company has changed to become a multi-energy company, which will soon be called Total Energies, the, the S matters. But what do the facts say? The fact says that Total remain one of the major global emitters worldwide, with 99.7% of its energy mix based on fossil fuels, and that Total announced an ambition and not a commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. On the 28th of May, its shareholders will have an opportunity to give an advisory vote on three 2030 climate targets. The first one is a 40% reduction of scope one and two emissions by 2030. I won't spend more, more time on it, considering scope one and two emissions only account for 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So what matters is what total will do on its scope three emissions, two things. The first one is a 20% reduction of the average carbon intensity of its energy products against a 15% targets previously. 
it's better, but it's still far from the 90% reduction targets that we should see in order to be aligned with a 1.5 trajectory. And these absolute emissions, uh, this uh, intensity um, reduction targets does not imply an absolute emission of its uh, carbon emissions, and it's rather based on a change of its energy mix with a reduction of the share of oil in its energy mix. Actually, Total CEO stated recently that he intends to keep flat or slightly reduce only its oil production. And as most of you must know, Total keeps opening new oil projects, um, including uh, including the, the ECOP and Tilenga projects in, in uh, East Africa. So the last objective that Total will uh, announce is an objective of ensuring that the level of scope three emissions worldwide emission will be lower in 2030 in absolute terms compared to the level of 2015. How great it is, but where is the number? In fact, what we know is that the emissions COP3 will reduce in Europe, but will grow outside Europe. And as you can see, Total, again, doesn't give any numbers. What we know is that Total intends to increase its production of fossil fuels by 2030. Its energy production will increase with half of it being based on a growth in gas. 30% uh, is the number of uh, the energy production that will, I mean, it's uh, gas production will increase by 30% by 2030 compared to 2019 level. And total's forecast indicates a 50% growth of its overall fossil fuel production from 2015 to 2030. So how so can Total uh, reduce its COP3 emissions while increasing its fossil fuel production? Maybe by relying on a significant amount of CCS, NBS, and also on offsets. Unfortunately, doesn't, Total doesn't disclose any numbers about it. Um, what we can see in its climate scenario called Rupture 2050 is that Total is forecasting amount of NBS and CCS that are far uh, above what the IPCC um, estimate to be uh, feasible. So what to vote on the 28th of May on total so-called say on climate first on one thing that investors need to know is that it's a one-shot vote. Total is not committing to do it uh, every year. And Total only said today that he proposed to inform its shareholders afterwards on an annual basis on the, about how it will uh, implement uh, its strategy. So a vote in favor of Total's climate plan is actually going to reduce uh, the action at Total and will not push a company to upscale its climate plan. It will actually be a waste of the critical time we have left to limit global warming to 1.5. On the contrary, Total clearly says that if the resolution is not adopted, he will engage his shareholders to understand the reason why they voted against. So in other words, that vote against is the only way to push a company to go back to the drawing board and upscale its, its engagement in terms of climate commitments and also bring more transparency on what on the targets that are currently missing. What is the scope three emissions target by 2030? What is the share of NBS and CCS in scope one, scope one, two, and three emissions targets? And what is uh, the exact mix, energy mix uh, of total in 2030? You might have seen the slide before total always mixed uh, in the green part, uh, sustainable renewable energy, biomass, and also gas plants. I will also say that so on the 28th of May, it's a question of voting against Total's climate plan. There is also a renewal of the mandate of the terms of office of the CEO, Patrick Spouyane, that we uh, think should be a sanction for its lack of um, uh, capacity to bring a Paris aligned climate strategy. And that would be the only way to actually uh, for investors to fulfill their, commi their own commitment to become a net zero investors and to align with a 1.5 trajectory. And I will stop here in order to stay under my five minutes. Amazing. Thank you so much. Very helpful. And thank you for pointing out a couple of things to watch out for, including, for example, the question of, you know, if your goal is to reduce scope three, is it consistent with increased production goal, for example, among others? And obviously the timing question, 
which I'm, I presume Xioning Biao, who is the lead analyst of the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, will also pick up some of these questions as well. If I may, I mean, Xioning, shall we, shall we go to you now? Great. Yes, thank you. thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you for having me as part of this webinar. My name's Shuling. I'm the lead global analyst for the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility in the global team. And today I wanted to talk about the key things that we think we should be considering when assessing the credibility of climate transition plans, particularly for oil and gas. We'll look at three things today. The first one is exactly what do we expect of a climate vote? What is the purpose? What does the yes and no vote look like? The second thing is what is the state of the sector at the moment? How do they look on their current climate uh, plan commitments? And the third thing is just to share some of our analysis on Shell's uh, transition plan um, and, and take your questions. So I will start with looking at the purpose of the climate vote. So say on climate votes have come on rapidly, you know, particularly voluntary adoption. For companies, this is a great chance to get buy-in from investors around the strategies they're implementing for climate transition and ultimately get endorsement for the path that they've taken. For investors, particularly those who have set their own net zero commitments, this is a chance to get in place genuine climate plans. But what does that look like? And what does yes constitute? We'll talk about that more here today, but we've outlined some of the things that we think are important to describe a credible plan. And in our mind, a yes vote should be supported by a good commitment and clear, credible, robust actions. But on the other side of that, um, good decision-making and governance also requires that plans that are not quite ready, that don't have the information required or don't have robust assumptions are put back to management to think again with a sign of a no vote, simply saying that more work needs to be done. If we move on to our second point, looking at where the oil and gas majors are, we look at a subset of seven against the net zero company benchmark that CA100 has released. This is really the only relevant benchmark in assessing climate plans this year. It takes what is essentially hundreds of pages of information and puts it into nine indicators that are quite useful covering target strategy and governance. If we look just quickly at where some of the companies are being assessed, we can see that only three have yes assessments against any indicators, and that's heavily weighted towards corporate governance. But I think as an investor, I'd be asking, well, what is really the ask? Are we saying that we wanna say yes against all nine indicators? So for us, we think there's three indicators that are very important, and I'll take them through you now. So the first one, medium terms emission reduction targets. So that's targets the company has set for the period of 26 to 35. That matters because climate action now is going to be material to getting us towards a 1.5 degree pathway. And you can see um, from this slide that none of the major oil and gas companies that we looked at have an aligned 1.5 degree target. The next aspect we looked at was the decarbonisation strategy. From this, um, the indicator actually just looks at which companies have described actions and quantified those actions to meet their own targets. 1.5 degrees does not even come into it, and yet these companies have not met that requirement. Again, if we look at capital expenditure, um, as Andrew pointed out, there's both risk here with stranded assets, but also it's a great signal to investors to see how serious um, companies are. And there's broadly not even alignment with their own targets, let alone a 1.5 degree pathway. So net zero um, company bank chart shows us that there's a lot of work to be done across the three really important indicators to assess climate plans. But that's really just looking at disclosures and commitments, not credibility of the planned actions. So we're also gonna take you through Shell now, looking at a bottom-up analysis. So for Shell, how have we defined what we see as a credible pathway? I think the key thing that I wanted to point out on this slide is that it needs to focus on the next 10 years. 2050 net zero is nice, but it's not relevant. 
Firstly, um, the climate needs action now. And secondly, management just don't have visibility on that time horizon. Operational plans and budgets can't be designed over that length of time. Um, if we look at what we do know about Shell today, um, the capital expenditure is not aligned with its own targets. Um, it is using offsets and CCS within its um, strategy. It is increasing its fossil fuels, particularly through its gas production. It is unclear whether it's reducing absolute emissions, although it says emissions have peaked, the pathway is uncertain. And we'll look on the following slides around um, the actions for the next 10 years and if the actual target is aligned with the 1.5 degree pathway. This is, um, for those who don't know, Shell's intensity targets. This is what they are, and we'll be focusing on the 20% reduction for 2030. Okay, so to understand um, how we should be voting on these climate plans, we need to look at the target and the actions. So here we look at the target's credibility. Is it aligned to a 1.5 degree pathway? Now, as it sits, there's no um, scenario where we can check oil and gas against 1.5, so we've used what we can, which is the transition pathways initially initiatives below two degrees. What you can see is Shell is along the yellow bars and its 2016 intensity baseline is above the sector at that point. So it's already a high intensity business. But then we look at how it will track across the years to 2030. By 2030, it's still going to be 30% above what it needs to be to be aligned with Paris. Part of this is driven by its gas production. So under IPCC's 1.5 degrees pathway, gas production should decline 3% per annum. Over the next five years, Shell's looking to increase their production by 4%. If we extrapolate this to a 10-year 2030 horizon, Shell could end up producing twice the amount that is aligned with a 1.5 degree equivalent pathway. Now, there's a risk I'll spend too long on this slide, so I'm, trying, I'm going to be super quick, but the key thing I want to highlight to everybody today is out of all the pages of disclosure that you'll see on Shell's climate plans, this is the only one that matters. This is looking at the actions that they're going to implement to reach their 2030 targets. So regardless if you think that's a credible goal, what are the things that are going to get them there and can they make it? The questions we have are around um, what are the material things that are impacting this emissions reduction? Are those things um, credible and robust with the robust assumptions and feasible? And is this aligned with the actions that would be taken under 1.5 degree pathway? I won't go into the details, but on the right, obviously offsets are material and there's significant problems with implementing them today. Um, for example, the offsets that they require is a 30 fold increase on what they have today. It implies forests the size of Washington by 2030. CCS, Tim will talk to more, but has significant problems around um, actual application and feasibility. Um, and there's not a lot of working examples of geological storage of CCS today. Um, the bit that we think Shell needs to really focus on is a material part of their plan. So that's the low carbon power and fuels. But actually when you go into the details, there's no, um, there's no plans that actually support that quantum of change. And then we go across, we talked about gas being um, misaligned with the 1.5 degree pathway and operational efficiency, that's really just business as usual. Um, the next slide, I'll just share some analysis we've done. Because Shell didn't give us any absolute emission numbers, we wanted to try and quantify the impact of offsets and other activities on their targets. Um, we've taken a 2019 baseline because that was pre-COVID, assume they applied their offsets and CCS today, and we can see that the change from those two things is going to drive 50% of their emission reduction target, at least. What does that mean? It means they're highly vulnerable to reaching their target if they can't execute on those things well. And that secondly, the thing that actually should be most important just has the least detail, which is this round mix of efficiency and transformation of their business. In summary, these are the kind of key things that we would ask Shell to do um, for investors to support a strategy um, that is lined with a 1.5 degree pathway. We think it is really too early for oil and gas um, to get endorsements on plans that will um, be implemented for the next three years. And as an investor base, especially those that are, have their own net zero targets and are concerned with credible climate transition, a baseline needs to be set of what is um, credible today. 
Um, we've done a few research reports on that and we would love to hear from investors on this issue because we um, appreciate it is complex. Um, that's all I have today. Great, thank you so much, Shanae. I'm sure that, I mean, there are lots of questions for you as well that are appearing in the box. In answer to one of them, which I can answer, which is to say that, yes, I, the slides will be made available to all of you afterwards. And they're also, a thank you as well, Shuling, for outlining for us as well the question of, you know, the target set by the companies, but also how should we assess actions and time frame of the actions as well against those targets in terms of credibility, as well as the question around CapEx as well, which I'm sure we will go back to. Now, I feel a bit bad whisking you through all this really rich content, but next up we have another for the next five, seven minutes, Tim Bush, who's the head of corporate governance for the for Perk Pension Investment and Research Consultants. Tim, please take us away for the next seven minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if I may introduce myself before um, sharing the screen on the slides, um, I am head of corporate governance and financial analysis at Perk. Clearly, the financial analysis side of climate change is extremely important from a governance perspective, as we've seen over the last month with more, more resolutions coming forward. What we're looking at is consistency of arguments, as well as um, do the numbers stack up. Very often, if you do a fairly superficial dig beneath the um, uh, arguments, there's a lot of things that don't stack up. So if I can just begin to share my slides with you all. So the issue regarding Shell, let's talk about its strategy. It's caveated with a disclaimer, which actually takes the form of a, a legal disclaimer at the end of what they put out. Its position is conditional on customers no longer using hydrocarbons. So its pledges are actually not pledges. They're extremely conditional. And I give it the analogy of a circular argument whereby this pub will stop serving alcohol by uh, 11 p.m., provided our customers stop buying it to drink. Um, I actually think it's a dangerous strategy. We saw this with Kodak, which left its transformation too late. Uh, I, as a shareholder at Hermes, uh, focused saw it with HMV, um, which had the competition from online streaming of music as opposed to going into the shop to buy DVDs. It didn't turn out any better for HMV than it did for Kodak. Um, we have to bear in mind that the biggest producers of oil at the moment are petrostate uh, enterprises, uh, governmental organizations, and um, you know, where, where is the competitive advantage going to be? Is it going to be uh, private sector oil companies or will it be public sector ones? We only have to bear in mind, BP was only privatized in 1987 spent most of existence um, as, as a nationalized body. And the key issue is that there's a cost-led revolution in renewables and markets in commodities favor the lowest marginal cost producer. That is the issue that I think that the oil companies got to face. Uh, can't see the wood for the trees. Um, Shell have promised uh, nature-based solutions of 120 million tons removal by 2030. Uh, we've done the sums and I'm pleased to see that it's been calculated the same way down there in Australia. That represents a new forest the size of Washington State that's got to appear within nine years. I find that quite difficult to um, envisage. Um, the other flaw of the argument is that nature-based solutions are resource limited land basically, but they're actually intended for hard to abate sectors. They're not there to delay decarbonisation. They are there to pick up the residual emissions in things like cement, and chemicals that actually switch from power to renewables um, won't be able to deal with. There's the other issue of surely if they're there to pick up uh, residual emissions, aren't they a common good? Who should own them? It's a big issue there. Who should be owning these new forests that are actually there to provide the mop-up of the last bit of carbon? And I say tropical versus other. Um, tropical trees, uh, in theory, um, absorb more carbon dioxide than conifers, considerably more. And therefore, if you start to push the companies, what you find is they argue that they will be planting more tropical trees. The thing you have to take account of, the tropical trees are further apart. It sounds odd, but I've seen them do sums on conifer levels of packing in. And I can't really imagine a rainforest where the trees are three feet apart somehow. Uh, as a little flag here, is Total intending to plant tropical forest on Savannah? I think it is. Smoke and mirrors. Um, 
Schuling has mentioned um, carbon capture and storage. Um, there are technical questions about it, not least there's no working example of carbon capture and storage in gas. So Shell refers to 25 million uh, tonnes of carbon capture and storage by 2035, but for what emissions and whose emissions? If uh, decarbonisation for customers is a matter of customers, then it can't relate to that. So what are they going to attach this carbon capture storage to? Is it hydrogen? In which case they have a problem that is looking as if uh, electrolysis from renewables, i.e. green hydrogen, will be cheaper to produce by 2030 and people are already prepared to pay for it, even with a higher cost. You also have the problem of, um, is, is it there to remove the reservoir CO2 in natural gas, uh, such as the Barrow Island Gorgon project in Australia? If so, this CCS isn't actually reducing um, current emissions. It's there as a necessity of the um, expansion of natural gas because natural gas reservoirs have methane in it. The methane is already broken down uh, to CO2 in many, many um, reservoirs. In the case of Gorgon, it's 25%, it's huge. So Shell's CCS ventures to date did include Quest in Canada, which if you dig beneath it is actually hydrogen produced to then crack the tar to create oil grade petroleum. So the hydrogen is used for oil extraction. And in Barrow Island, Western Australia, this has actually been a real, real scandal and the Western Australian government is looking for its money back because it didn't work for several years and has been Australia's largest emitter by far. Um, so back to this 25 million tonnes pledge. I don't think this is what I call prospectus, prospectus standard level of disclosure of either strategy, activity and financing. If this was a company going for an IPO, I don't think it would be able to make such um, claims. They would need to be backed up. We then get on to this word intensity. Um, I don't like it at all. What it's effectively uh, reflecting is that if you switch from burning um, a long chain hydrocarbon, such as octane, to methane, then you will get more joules of energy per unit of carbon. That's a factor, of, that's a product of the fact that there are more relative hydrogen bonds in methane than in the other um, longer chain hydrocarbons, but intensity just deals with the intensity of the emission from combustion. What about the reservoir CO2 um, that's going to be released? Uh, what about fugitive emissions of methane? Methane is a far more powerful greenhouse gas. So I think what is relevant are actually life cycle greenhouse gas emissions per unit of usable energy obtained. You need to dig down that far because energy obtained also relates to the efficiency of it. Um, diff, diff, different um, processes have different efficiencies. So please, can we talk about life cycle, life cycle greenhouse gases? Also, as a matter of principle, calling um, something uh, neutral or net zero carbon is plain wrong. Shell has done this. Methane is methane. I'm saying it's not net zero alcohol merely because the barman was teetotal. The idea behind um, net zero methane is that the transportation extraction was net zero. The product is exactly the same. So my point here is that net zero really requires what I call net zero tolerance of euphemisms. And as it all go, go to Australia or Yorkshire if you want to find countries where people tend to use less euphemisms than uh, in other places. So overall, as a scorecard of key elements of the um, Shell proposals, a strategy of instep with customers, no. Nope. Uh, offsets, nature-based solutions and CCS, well, they could be good, but we need to know more about it. There's a lot of issues there. Intensity of emissions, no. Nope. Interestingly, if you look at Barclays' um, resolution yesterday, which got 14% um, uh, for, for, for the shareholder resolution, Barclays is a really good case in point. The absolute emission reductions by 2040 for Barclays are 50%, but they present intensity reduction of 85%. It's the 50% that matters, not the 85. Intensity is effectively needs to be replaced by volume. So at the end of the day, um, I think PR is a key feature of the story and science-based targets require science-based outcomes to deliver. So really investors need to engage as much with the subject matter as they do with the companies. Thank you.
Great. Thank you very much, Tim, as well. So that actually is leaving us nicely with a good 20 minutes for some of the questions and responses. And our, our panelists will see in our box as well the kind of question that has been raised with you. And some are very specific and technical. But I thought that as a chair, what I would do is I would actually pick some of the more general questions as a lead off. And I, I obviously encourage our panelists to try and answer the question if you could on the more specific issues related to your presentation, especially. I'm sorry, my next door neighbors feel as if they just start banging on the wall. So apologies. So I'm going to pick two very sort of general questions from the Q&A box for now, and then we can zoom in more detail. One is a very, I mean, maybe this is the sort of elephant in the room question, which is, well, two really. One is, what should investors do, in your opinion? <laughs> and the second question is, in your discussions with investors, what do you think those who are leaning on the corporate engagement side are currently thinking right now? I, I wonder who wants to take that on. I mean, Lucy, would you like to take that on first? Yes, thanks a lot. Um, I think our opinion in terms of what investors should vote on these two uh, company climate plan is quite clear. Um, there is a, a clear uh, copy which is uh, or assignment which is delivered by these companies and uh, investors should uh, take a, an opinion about it uh, based on what they can find in it. And currently, what we learned from this presentation is that not only they are inadequate to respond to the uh, to the objective, delivering a plan and targets that can bring a company aligned with a 1.5 trajectory, and are also very incomplete, as I said, for total, a lot of information are actually missing for investors to even assess uh, the risks that are re related to their, in to their investment. Um, I think currently a lot of investors are for, I would say, the, um, the serious one or the ones that are deeply engaged that are not playing about or pretending to be engaged about climate. The ones that are engaged might be thinking, should we support like the progress being made by these two companies? Because every year we, there is slightly like slight in progress being made they are asking an opinion uh this year um total went from 15 to 20 percent so that's progress i think uh, they need to think about the time that is left in order to make the change which is required um there is no time left for such baby steps uh it's really the time to push a company to to as a carbon tracker keeps saying to reduce our fossil fuel production. And as long as the numbers are not going down, there is no debate to have about is the company doing enough or not enough. So um, I think that's uh, for the investors that might be serious about climate, they need to encourage a company to do more, or sign a statement, write a letter, whatever to say, they're encouraging the company to go further, but they need to vote on what the assignment actually contains. And the other investors, unfortunately, a lot of them would like to pretend acting on climate. And what matters most for them would be to say, hey, it was a climate vote, so I will vote in favor of it. And here, um, I will call this uh, uh, investor just hypocritical. Hi, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I go to you actually, Nick Shuling? I was just thinking you outlined sort of the three things, targets, action, capex, in your presentation very clearly. So in answer to the question in terms of where do you think the investors or the engagement prone folks are leaning at the moment, would you like to sort of have, have a go at that, Shuling? Yeah, I think um, a lot of investors we've spoke to recognise that the quality of the plans that have been put forward for votes probably aren't the same quality that you would put forward to a management team or a board to even, you know, approve a, a new set of infrastructure or computers. Like there is a disconnect between what management have offered up in this case um, for investors to assess. And I think going back to the three things that you mentioned, um, having honest conversations with investors with credible information is crucial to be able to even have a conversation about climate votes. So my ask is that that, is, um, that message is given to companies um, so that real information for assessment can be put forward to assess targets and actions 
um, you know, that one slide that Shell put forward out of the multitude of documents it has, I think is just not sufficient for investors to be able to make these decisions. Thanks for that, Shilling. I actually, can I come to you actually, Andrew, because I saw that there were quite a lot of questions on, on the Q&A for you, but also a lot of questions around some of the questions around chemicals and the downstream as well, investment portfolio questions. So I just wonder whether you want to take some of these on. Yeah, by all means, yeah. Um, I've been trying to bash through the questions as much as possible, but yeah, can't get through them all. Um, but yeah, so thanks for, so I'll be raising the point around um, um, refining and, and downstream. I mean, a lot of conversation clearly uh, focuses on the upstream side. We actually published a report um, on uh, on the downstream side. It was a couple of years ago now, but the issue we have with um, with downstream is that it doesn't really, or refining, I should say, is it doesn't doesn't decline in the same way as upstream production does. It's just once it's built, it's probably there. And you know, there are refineries that have been around for hundred years, admittedly, obviously, with bits and pieces re replaced. Uh, you know, or, or the whole thing replaced several times, probably. But what what that means is effectively that you know, once you've built a certain amount of capacity and demand for crude products starts falling, that means you you have structural overcapacity. And what that means is that in order to push out that structural overcapacity from the refining industry. The mechanism is lower margins across industry and so you have you end up the with the industry being faced by two problems firstly it's processing less crude secondly it's processing it at less dollars per barrel so the earnings impact is really quite significant and in terms of the uh, the petrochemicals um side of things so petrochemicals currently about 12 percent of a barrel even if you assume it continues to grow and i think the ies sds scenario has it growing to about 20 percent of, of global production Small amount of global production, but increasing in absolute terms, you know, it remains a minority. And, and so, so generally speaking, although you might have pockets of you know, speciality chemicals, etc., that are are resilient. I mean, clearly the world is you know, plastics itself has risen up as a challenge uh, in environmental terms for different reasons. But as a whole, the kind of the downstream industry, when, when you end up, end up have a scenario of, of declining demand, finds itself in a very, very difficult place. We we modelled that earnings would halve over the next um, next 20 years or so. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Because I've had a question I can see up here that says I've been spreading uh, disinformation. Um, that is from Marguerite Cooper. Um, uh, several questions. The first one is about, are we going to leave production to the Russians and the Saudis of the world? Well, that's a different question for investors. We don't invest on the basis of, um, uh, of, of that question at the moment. Now, um, the question on intensity says that Shell includes all value chain emissions. Well, first problem I have is the word, the term value chain. Could we please call it production cycle? There's no value in a lot of these things. The value chain is, an, is a, a um, loaded term that assumes value. <laughs> Um, so could we please call it production cycle? Um, but I'd love to know um, if I'm wrong that Shell's uh, cycle emissions include methane, and I'd love to know if they include the reservoir CO2 that comes out. I think not. Um, so sorry to be pushy on that one, but um, yeah, the, the, the term value chain is, 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 is precisely one of those points we shouldn't um, be using. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. My, my drilling is getting really bad here. Forgive me, everybody. Sorry, the 500 people locked on you didn't bargain for this. Sorry. Now, um, Tim, I, I have a question for you, which is that you are the one who actually mentioned uh, quite a lot of questions about the nature-based solutions, but also the question of CCUS as well. I mean, clearly, this is a dilemma, not just for these companies, but for the larger community in terms of how do we tackle these questions around offsets and, and carbon capture and storage question. What would your advice be in terms of what, how the investors should be looking at these questions and also your experience so far in terms of engagement, because you're also involved with CA100 as well, yeah? Yes. Uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, there's a good article uh, on LAP's website, LAPF's website. Uh, the history of carbon capture and storage is that it was essentially a promise to provide clean coal. And um, most of the numbers envisaged for carbon capture and storage usage was to be used in coal. The problem is that coal fire power stations are falling away and therefore those aren't there to attach the CCS to. 
Uh, there were two coal-based um, CCS power stations in North America. Uh, the one in Texas is recently closed on economics grounds. It just would require subsidy to keep going, which I say is against uh, the background of falling um, prices of renewables. That therefore raises the question, well, what about CCS and gas? There is no working model of CCS and gas for various reasons. Firstly, it's more expensive to uh, remove the CCS, uh, the carbon dioxide from gas because there's less of it. It sounds um, rather ironic, but basically it's harder to remove low concentrations of CO2 from flues than more concentrated ones. Also, there are problems with the lower level of um, uh, carbon dioxide allowing oxidation of the, of the amine solvent. There's an additional problem of gas plants are used basically for intermittent power on and off. And um, a study from BASE has shown that it takes 200 minutes to warm a CCS plant up. That doesn't fit very well with a coal, uh, with, a, with a gas power station. It's only going to be on for two hours. Thanks, thanks, Tim. I think that's my question is oh, really yeah. about how does it really how, how should we be assessing it in terms of the commitment, that's all, rather than the mechanics of this in a way? I know you that the two are related, obviously. Mechanics because actually there's no evidence that it works. So you've got to weigh up the mechanics and the um, economics. And there's the additional problem that it's not actually net zero. The best that's been achieved so far in power is 90%. That still leaves you 10. Great, thank you so much. I mean, I'm gonna to go to another question. I mean, again, not being a specialist in this, I'm gonna to lean towards some of the more general question. I'm hoping that our panelists could answer the more technical ones as well on the screen, which is, I've got one from Duncan Wilson here, which is a general one, which is, how feasible is it to expect shareholder-driven companies to lay out binding and funded science-based hard commitments towards this topic? When, in, in this question, it says, when, National producers aren't necessarily doing the same when there's no clear framework for carbon pricing, right, such as market support and possibly subsidies towards other solutions. What is the panelist's view on this? Yeah, so I mean, I can, I can, I can jump in briefly on that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, clearly, what, if you're a shareholder in an individual company, Shell Total, whoever else it might be. Clearly, the important thing is what's happening to the companies that you're invested in. And we do hear the kind of the argument that, okay, well, you know, if we don't do it, someone else will. Um, it's feel, it feels a bit like, um, you know, fear of moving, uh, fear of missing out or FOMO, rather than it does, you know, the, the whole kind of value over uh, volume um, uh, agenda that's been so apparently prominent over the last couple of years. Um, so I, I no, I think that would be that would be the uh, the first point I'd make. No, but yeah, welcome to the other panelists. Not actually, I'll, I'll make another point. Why not? Um, so again, to bring it to bring it back to my point around sort of focusing on assets that um, uh, that are competitive in a low carbon economy. If the assets we're talking about are the ones that are further up the the, the value chain, the ones that might be that would be stranded anyway. Let other, why, not, why not let other people take that risk? I mean, it, it's up to a company as to what position they want to put themselves in in terms of their, um, you know, their uh, uh, their position on the cost curve and their resilience in these low carbon outcomes. It's not, you know, it's not a duty of directors to try and uh, go ahead with all all assets they that they that they that are available to them. It's about generating returns within within a given risk tolerance. Um, so, you know, if there are assets that they think don't work in a low carbon outcome. NOCs or private equity or however it might be, what is happy to take that risk, you know, then by all means, it's a different model. Can I just add that the um, debate about carbon pricing really got going when renewables were more expensive than um, fossil fuels. Um, and, and the debate hasn't really moved forward in terms of recognising the much lower marginal cost of renewables. And um, I find it difficult to see how a carbon tax sits on top of something that is now already more expensive than it was in relative terms. Great, thanks. I, yes, that's a good, good logic to remind ourselves of. So let me ask the, the, the whole panel again. There's some questions coming out, which I think are quite nice for the last 10 minutes of our time, which I'm gonna pile them onto you. The first one is, I think, a rather more controversial one, which was that there was a, uh, a questioner who suggested that the plans that are put out are obviously inadequate 
according to this questioner, and therefore, what do the panelists think are the motives of Charlotte Hotel for putting these votes out at this point? And also, I think that we also have questions around what are the implications really for voting with them in terms of the short term three to five year implications if there is a majority vote, for example, for Shell's transition plan and for that matter for, I mean, I think Total One, Lucy already reminded us what that meant. So it's really for Shell, I think this question. So I wonder whether or not uh, our panelists want to tackle this question in terms of the motivation for putting these votes out and what are the implications for going with it, and especially for Shell at this point. And then uh, Shuling, would you like to take this on? Yeah, I will. Um... I think, yeah, this has all come a lot faster than everyone expected, I think. And those companies have taken the opportunity to make the votes this year. So there's very little time to actually review the commitments. Although having said that, there's not a lot of detail there. Um, I think it's a bit of game theory and opportunism to cement themselves as having an endorsed climate plan and being leaders in this area. Um, you know, unfortunately, as we've talked about today, um, that doesn't mean that there's um, substance, I guess, to what is being proposed. Um, and that was the second part of the question, Bernice. What are the short term implications, the three to five year implication to go with the management? Yes. So for Shell as an example, um, so its emissions peaked in 2018, it has intensity targets all the way to its 2050 targets um, where it's got net zero. Emissions can increase, emissions can increase right up to 2018 levels. And there's nothing really within the detail of their plans that says that it won't, especially considering the, um, you know, the increasing focus on gas. So I guess that is the concern of shareholders that you're ultimately locking in these increased emissions that how are we going to get rid of them? Like that's accumulating in our environment. Um, and all the abatement technologies can only do so much. So I think that's the real position um, for these plans or the real what's at stake. Brilliant. Now one minute each. We have three more minutes. So I will go in this order. Uh, Tim, one minute. Then Andrew and then Lucy, I think. I think I've said enough, actually. So... Happy to pass to the others. Right, Lucy? Yes, thanks. Um, just one sort of question just before, I think uh, Total made it up only uh, before to avoid an external resolution. It, may, it might be good to remind everyone that Total faced a climate resolution last year and didn't want that to happen again. So that was the main reason why Total went ahead with this um, say on climate. And I think a lot of things um, are relating that might be a little bit pro provocative, but a lot of things are about the theater that we are playing uh, in uh, or acting. And I think uh, it gives enough reasons to many investors to actually vote with the management and, and, uh, and still affirm that they are doing it on behalf of climate. Uh, we might remind everyone that some of the biggest um, investors uh, that are members of the Climate Action 100 Plus last year voted against a climate resolution. And this year, they will use the argument that it's a climate resolution that they are supporting, even if it's not aligned with um, a 1.5 trajectory. And I think a lot of things are also connected to short-term business interests that you can have with Shell or Total. Um, and a lot of uh, things obviously are connected with vested interests. I think there were a great study published uh, recently by Desmog about the connection between uh, the financial institutions and, and um, the oil and gas company. And I think it's a lot of reasons might be found in it and, and the company found enough um, they are playing the game. They are just giving enough uh, information and enough progress to uh, give the good reasons for the investors to vote again with management while pretending acting on climate. Great, thank you. I think I have a question, Tim, for you that I would like you to take on, which is a question of, it says that why don't CA 100 plus uh, Engage, I'm looking for the question. I think it's specifically for you, which I thought was an interesting one. The investors only back transition strategy for companies which get a yes scores on those indicators that Schuling mentioned. And you have about 30 seconds to answer that. Yeah, I would have agreed with that. Um, by my analysis of the um, TPI uh, ratings, Shell would rank below BP and certainly wouldn't rank for recommendation of support. But if I can clarify, 
I'm a member of the CA100 plus group on Shell. The CA100 plus group did not come up with the answer. Two members of the group signed a non-disclosure agreement with Shell that other members of the group weren't privy to. So what has been announced as CA100 plus wasn't CA100 plus. It was the views of two investors who signed a non-disclosure agreement with Shell. Okay, thank you for that, Tim. Uh, Andrew, why don't you take us home with your messaging? I mean, you are our host as well. So perhaps if you could help us summarize in terms of the question of credibility uh, in your last one minute, please do, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess um, you know, the first thing I'd say is, you know, understand it's hard for an oil and gas company to find themselves in a position where the model that they've had for the last 100 years and has been very successful in that period now and wants to change and these big companies that are going to take a bit of a bit of time to turn around i think that you know the first thing uh, just in, i suppose an, another point to make is that given how quickly this is changing as we've seen there's really been a people understand these things much better than they did a year or two ago they understand kind of what works and what doesn't you know, what the shortcomings of intensity targets shortcomings of targets that are 30 years in the future compared to in the next 10 years or so you know, people get it so I, I you know i think there's a real uh imperative to do things properly the first time around excuse me sorry, my phone. uh rather than um rather than have to yeah. like go through the process of having to relaunch things every year particularly if you've signed up, up to something that doesn't uh, suggest change for three years three years ago it might as well be ancient history in all this discussion and the set and, and and the final point i make again is just to reiterate the importance of showing that your investments that you're making are walking the walk while you talk the talk on in, on the emissions side great thank you i think that the message i i gather from our speakers is pretty clear that it is extremely important that investors are supporting credible climate transition strategies in terms of time frame, but also action and also business plans that are actually going to deliver for the, for the world a Capara's aligned set of actions from these companies. And I think that this, this webinar certainly raised many interesting questions and I think deserve follow up with all the panelists if you have time, which all of you will get the, not only their presentation, but I understand, I think their contact detail as well, if you want to contact the individual analysts further and have further discussions with them as well. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining us for this webinar. Uh, you, will, you will hear from Carbon Tracker more on this topic, and I have no doubt, and all the material will be circulated to you. And as this meeting is on the record, then feel free to come back and revisit some of the rich content as well. Again, I feel that it was a very, very well win but extremely important hour that we have in terms of understanding the lay of the land on on these upcoming votes that are coming up, but also the broader question around investor engagement, obviously, and an and assessment around credibility of climate transition plans. So I look forward to hearing more from all of you and look forward to the result as well from these votes coming up in the AGMs and see where we are. Thank you very much all for joining us today. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks everyone.